I'm going to show you two things about electron configurations. It's very easy to go through a chemistry class and learn how to do an electron configuration. We're going to start with how to do an electron configuration, how to write them out for different elements. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to try and go through and explain what they are a little bit, give you an introduction into quantum numbers and quantum chemistry, and why it is that you're learning how to do these electron configurations. So, it turns out that the periodic table is just a tremendous tool for being able to do and construct electron configurations based on what element. The reason for that is because the periodic table is organized in a way that lines up with how the electrons add in their different kinds of motion. And additionally, every time you're moving over one square in the periodic table, you're adding a proton and an electron. So what we're going to do is we're going to outline three different kind of parts of the periodic table. I'm sorry, four parts of the periodic table. We're going to put helium here over from there. And these two columns here, we're going to call the S block. Over here, let's choose a different color here. So we're going to outline from boron to neon, and then all the way underneath all of them. We're going to call the P block. Helium is part of the S block. And then we're going to outline from zinc to copernicium. All the way over here, perfect. This is going to be our D block. And then down here, we're going to have our F block. So we split up the periodic table into these four sections. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to articulate what the electron configuration is for any element based on what row the block is in, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, what part of the periodic table you're in, S, P, D, or F, and how many, how many electrons are in that particular region. So let's do a few examples to kind of give you the idea. Let's start with something really simple. We're going to start with carbon. So the electron configuration of carbon I'm going to put here. Here's how you can do it. What you do is simply start counting every single box until you get to this particular element. So the sixth one is carbon here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count every single box. And the way I'm going to count them is this. I'm going to look at which period or row of the periodic table these are in. So right now I'm starting with the first row. And I'm going to write that down. So for carbon, I'm going to write down 1. And I'm in the S block, so I'm going to write down S. And then I'm going to count how many boxes there are until I get to the particular one I'm looking for. So 1, 2. And then I'm going to move on from 1 and 2 to 3. So now I'm in the second row, still in the S block. And I'm going to count 1, 2, 2 boxes. Now I go on over to 5, and I'm over here. I'm still in the second row, so I'm going to write down a 2. Now I'm in the P block, so I'm going to write down P, and I count boxes 1, 2, 2, P, 2. Now, what you're writing down is you're writing down the configuration of the six electrons in carbon. So the number here, your atomic number, is how many protons you have. So as long as these are neutral atoms, they'll have the same number of electrons. So carbon atoms will have six, six electrons. And so here we have two electrons in the 1S state, two in the 2S state, and two in the 2P state. Okay. We're going to continue on, and I'll do one that's a little more complicated, but nothing too crazy. Let's go ahead and try sulfur. So for sulfur, we would do the same thing we did before. We'd start here, and these are all going to start in a very redundant fashion. So we're in the first row, S block, two electrons, two boxes. Then we go down to two, S block, two boxes. Then we continue on over to boron here. So now we're in the two P states. And we go one, two, three, four, five, six. 2p6, and then we come to the third row, we're back in the s block, so 3s, and there are two boxes, and then we're going to go over to the 3p, 1, 2, 3, 4, sulfur is the fourth box, so therefore 3p4. And if you add up the superscripts in these, it'll add up to 16, because those are describing the 16 electrons. Now, as we progress further down the periodic table, let's now go ahead and try bromine. The D block is going to be one level behind the period. So when I get to scandium here, this is not going to be 4D, it's going to be 3D. Okay, so let's look at that executed here. So bromine, we would start just like normal. We have 1S2, we'll go a little faster, 2S2, and we're over to 5 here, 2P6, all the way across. And we're down to the third row, S block, two boxes. Third row, P block, six boxes, 3P6. Now we're down to 19 here, so fourth, fourth row, S, and we have two boxes, 4S2. So now when we get to scandium, we're one behind by being in the D block, so we're in the third energy level, even though we're in the fourth row. 
So we're in three. We're now in the D block. And we're going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And now we're back in the P block. Now the P block is not lagging behind like the B is. So we're going to go with four P. We're going to count one, two, three, four, five. So that's how you can do this. Now, it's important to keep in mind the D lags behind by one. The F block fits right here between barium and lutetium and radium and lorentium, and those are gonna be two levels behind. So 6S is gonna be followed by 4F, and then 5D, and then 6P. 7S is gonna be followed by 5F, and then 5, or 6D, and then 7P, okay? So that's how you do an electron configuration, and I'm sure many of you have gotten to the point where you can do them. But what the next critical step is, is why are you doing these? What is the point of these? What are these? Okay, and to answer that question, we need to go a little deeper into chemistry. Um, and we need to look at something that are called quantum numbers. So what electron configurations are, is they are descriptions of the electrons in an atom. And so let's look at what some of those descriptions are. There are four numbers that represent information about how the electrons are moving. First one is called N, the principal quantum number. And to a high school student, this is what energy level your electron is in. You can think of energy levels as those rings that you might have done in middle school or maybe early in high school. Uh, but, but we could also think of it as how far away from the nucleus am I? Okay, so as we increase in energy levels, we're going to increase how far away from the nucleus we are. And that'll depend on how many protons are present. But generally speaking, higher energy level, further away than the other electrons in that atom, okay? So, first energy level is where we start. We would say we start at n equals one, and then we go on to two, three, four, five, six, seven. L is your angular quantum number. So it's, it's how the electron is moving about the atom, what its angular momentum is. And that is called L, so I write my L's like this. And then L can be zero, one, two, three, can go on beyond that, but usually doesn't. So if L is zero, that actually tells you what your orbital type is. That's our high school interpretation of this. So L equals zero is an S orbital, and that has a particular way that it moves about the nucleus. L equals one is a P orbital and has a different methodology for moving around the nucleus. Uh, L equals two is a D orbital, and L equals three is an F orbital. These do go beyond this. You won't see that in an introductory chemistry class, but they just go in alphabetical order after that G, H, I. The magnetic quantum number is which orbital? So an orbital is a mathematical description kind of of the, of the motion of the electron and, and the location of the electron from that motion. Um, and so for P orbitals, for instance, you have a PX, you have a PY, and you have a PZ that's coming into and out of the board that I'm not going to be able to draw well. So, so M is going to tell you which of these you're located, uh, which of those your electron is, is best described as how it's, how it's moving and where it's located. So the way I think of this is if you put a magnet up to this, the PX and the PY are going to interact with that magnetic field differently, and so the magnetic quantum number differentiates which orbital your electron is best described by. So for the magnetic quantum numbers, you're going to look at a situation that depends on what orbital type you're in in the first place, because for an s orbital, for l equal to 0, then your m can only be one value. There's only one s orbital to be in. So we center these at 0. But if you're in a p orbital, now your m can be negative 1, 0, or positive 1, where each one of these would represent the x, the y, or the z p orbital for that particular energy level. For d orbitals, we have five, five different orbitals per energy level. So we have negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, or plus two, where these would be the dxy, the dz squared, all of those. And then if we're l equal to three, we're in an f orbital. So in that case, we can go all the way from negative three to zero to positive three. So M tells you even more information about that particular angular momentum. And then there's one more, which is spin. And that can be thought of as a intrinsic spin, so a rotation of the electron. 
that's not 100% correct, but that's how I think of it, and that tends to serve me okay. So this can have two values. It can be plus one half, or it can be minus one half. So spinning one way or spinning the other way, depending on your perception. And we often call this spin up and spin down. So if we represent an electron as an arrow, so we're doing an orbital filling diagram, we would represent the spin up with an arrow pointing up, and we represent the spin down as an arrow pointing down. So we'll see that in a minute. So these four numbers combine to give you information about what your electron is doing. The electron configuration is a brief summary of what those electrons' quantum numbers are. So n is the first number of your electron configuration. So when I write out an electron configuration, I say 1s2. n is 1 is what this number is. This is in the first energy level, and it gives me information about the location of that electron. It's close to the nucleus. It's moving fast. The s, on the other hand, uh, uh, is, is derived from this angular quantum number. Okay? And then the two is how many electrons are in those two particular states. So from that information, we can then infer some information about the levels of m and s. So to do that, we would look at what's called an orbital filling diagram. So an orbital filling diagram, what we do is we eliminate the complexity of having a nucleus with all these electrons doing all these things around it. Or we eliminate the complexity of having even orbital that orbitals drawn about these because these are complicated shapes. And instead we represent every, every orbital as an energy state. Or we say the lowest in energy is lowest. So our 1s orbital is here, and then we, we fill them with electrons, okay? So we're gonna put an electron into the 1s state. Okay. Now, arrow represents an electron. Now initially, we start off with everything in the first, the second, the third, and the fourth energy levels are all degenerate or the same energy. But as we start to put electrons in here, these electrons are going to cause the interactions between other electrons we put into these states to change. And so when I start to actually fill my orbital diagram, let me get a different color here. And I start to do the 1s2 or the 2s2, that's going to shift my p orbitals differently than my s orbitals in energy. And so I end up filling the 2s before the 2p. The 2p are further away from the nucleus, and so they experience a different repulsion from these. If I just had a single electron, then I could promote this to here or here, or here or here or here, and it would be the same energy change. However, when I have four electrons, now there's interactions between these that shift these values. Okay? So that's why I fill them in a certain order. And there are rules for how I fill them. For instance, in the 2p, now that I have three different m values, I have three different options to put my second electron into the 2p for carbon. I can put it here, here, or here. So it turns out there's a rule called Hund's rule that governs which, which of those is going to happen. And it turns out the Hund's rule states that you're not going to pair it here because then it's too close to this and there's a repulsion between them. So instead you put it here where it's further away from this or here where it's further away from this. These are both equidistance and the actual orbital picture. So we put an electron here next, then we would put an electron here. Now that we've put those three, it's now energetically favorable to put the electron here rather than into the higher energy state of the 3s. So then I would start to pair until I got to my 2p6. Now I go into the next energy level, 3s1, 3s2, 3p, 3p2, 3p3, 4, 5, and 6. And then, instead of going into the 3d orbitals, the 4s and the 3d are now very, very similar in energy. And so, actually what ends up happening is they enter into the 3d and then move over to the 4s. But what interestingly happens is that sometimes the 3d ends up being lower in energy than the 4s. So there are two common examples of this, and then some less common ones. But in the case of 4s2, 3d4, or chromium's configuration, it's what we would predict based on the periodic table method I showed you at the beginning of this video. Well, it turns out that actually it is less energy to put the electron here rather than pair it here. So for that particular one, this ends up being incorrect and we end up with 4s1 for the 5. Likewise, if we continued filling this, for copper we would have expected 4s2, 3d9 it turns out that the pairing energy, based on all of the protons and electrons present, causes this to not occur as frequently, and that our most stable configuration is actually 4s1, 3d10. The elements underneath chromium and copper on the periodic table also do this, but there are other ones besides those eight that, that follow that particular electron configuration. 
um, kind of exception. Okay. Now, the order that I'm filling these, I'm putting these in the lowest energy first, and so that also is one of the rules, that we fill these up in the lowest energy first, and that's called the off-off principle, which basically states that we're just going to start filling this in the 1s, and we're going to go to the 2s, and the 2p, and the 3s, and so on and so forth, uh, is one of the governing rules. And then the other one that comes up very frequently is the poly exclusion principle. And there are two, two kind of ways to communicate this. There's a physics-y way and there's a chemistry way. And the physics way is that none of these electrons in this particular atom can have the same four quantum numbers, N, L, M, and S. The chemistry way of saying that is you can only have two electrons per orbital state. And if you do have two, they have to be opposing spins. And those two reconcile quite nicely. Okay. So the last part of this is, why do we care about these electron configurations? Well, what I can do with this is I can now look at this and, and kind of derive information. So one of the things we could do, is let's, let's backtrack a little bit here. Let's get rid of these for a second. So here I have an electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. So let's get the last part of that in there. So 3s2. 3p6, 4s1, it's the electron configuration, the final part of the electron configuration, potassium. So potassium is highly reactive, and it turns out that the reaction that it undergoes, it loses its final electron here. We know that this is the electron being lost because this one is the furthest from the nucleus. And so all of these other electrons are somewhat pushing this one away. And so it has a very weak net pull inward because it has 19 protons pulling on it, but it has 18 electrons pushing it away. And so this ends up being very reactive because just about anything that can pull harder on this electron than the combined force of the nucleus and the repulsion of these electrons, this goes away very quickly. And so in the reaction of potassium, we end up getting rid of this electron and we end up with the 3s2, 3p6 arrangement. So it gives us a tool to communicate what electrons are doing what and to analyze why, they, why the different elements undergo particular reactions and bonding the different interactions that occur between these chemicals.